Okay, one, two, three. Hey, welcome everybody to this uh, Friday late here in welcome. So those of you who are watching on YouTube and Facebook, you continue to get a um, view of my various hotel rooms uh, all over the world. Uh, we've now done shows from London, uh, Zurich, and uh, Paris. I, I wanted to do, I wanted to do a few shows from the Canary Islands uh, where I was at, where I was attending a conference, but the internet connection was just way, way, way too weak to even contemplate uh, trying to do that. So, um, so no, uh, it, so it's been a while. I apologize for that. It's been. Uh, I I think a week since uh, we had a show, so uh, uh, so uh, you know somebody's saying it's about the perfect time to visit Paris. It's uh, yeah, it's a beautiful day today. Unfortunately, I'm going to be here basically less than 24 hours, and uh, I, I've got to give a talk tomorrow, so I'm not going to be able to go and uh, do all the fun stuff that I love doing in Paris, like going to the Louvre or going to the Musée d'Orsay or just walking around the city. So uh, a little bit of walking, but uh, but uh, unfortunately, quick trip. No, no matter, been here before. I love Paris, it's a great city um, and uh, continues to be beautiful. Ta uh, walked around tonight and it's it's gorgeous. All right, um, a number of topics. I wanna uh, talk a little bit more about uh, Judge Kavanaugh and uh, it, it looks like the, there's breaking news on that. Something related to Kavanaugh that relates to Facebook, uh, Amazon's $15 minimum wage, uh, maybe some other things. We'll see. And of course, there's always the super chat that is accessible to those of you on YouTube. So if you want to ask a question and you're willing to put some money behind it, then uh, use the super chat feature on um, on uh, YouTube. All right. So uh, it looks like Kavanaugh is going to be approved by the Senate. Uh, it, it is a Democratic senator has now said that he would vote for Kavanaugh. And uh, I think almost all the Republicans, maybe with one exception, uh, have said that they would vote for him. So it, it looks like he will be approved probably 51 to 49 or 50 to 50 with uh, Mike Pence uh, breaking the tie. Uh, but it's uh, uh, it, it, it looks like it's going to happen. Uh, it's... Uh, you know, it's the right thing. Uh, I've said this before. I'm no fan of, of Brett Kavanaugh. I, I, I don't think he's, I'm not excited about him going to the Supreme Court. He's way too political as a judge. He's, he's had a career in politics. He's much too much a Republican rather than a judge with a clear judicial philosophy. He is too much of a conservative. Um, and and uh, I think would vote, <clears throat> would vote overthrow um Rose versus Wade and, and maybe some other potential um, issues regarding civil liberties. But so I, I, I've never been too enthusiastic about Kevin of, of, of the short list. You know, there was in the short list that Trump had. You know, I don't think I would have been excited by anybody, any of them. But I think I, I think he and the woman who was ultra Catholic were the two that I was least excited about. Uh, and primarily with Kavanaugh, it's because of how political he's been. He was part of the uh, Bush administration. He was part of the investigation of the Clintons and the whole impeachment. R ridiculous fiasco. And um, anyway, that, that that's the reasons. And then again, his judicial philosophy is far too, you know, mainstream standard conservative for my liking. I, I think probably Gorsuch is a far better judge. But given all that... Um, I think he's qual you know, he's qualified. Uh, and uh, I don't think, and I've said this from the beginning of these hearings, I don't think that uh, that these allegations were grounds for voting against them. I actually don't think these allegations should even be heard by the committee. I don't think the allegations are relevant to, to the issue before us. That is the issue of whether he should be appointed the Supreme Court. I've said this before, I'll say it one more time. It, it astounds me. I mean, I was, um, how people misrepresent my views about these issues. Um, I was reading somebody, somebody wrote a, let me just find this. Yeah, somebody wrote a um, 
on my uh, a comment under the video in YouTube, and he says, um, his treatment of the arbitrary as the possible is also disappointing. I discussed why uh, Ford's claim is not arbitrary. It might be wrong. It might be unproven. It might be uh, uh, lacking, you know, almost any evidence, but I wouldn't say, but it was not arbitrary. Epistemologically, it's not arbitrary. And uh, I never said we have to investigate. I said you have to investigate if you want to know the truth, but I don't think the truth is relevant here. Uh, he has insisted on a trial for Kavanaugh's ad lib. So again, I never insisted on a trial for Kavanaugh. I said that if you wanted to find the truth, you would have to take this to trial. But I, I've said over and over again, I don't think it's relevant because I don't think something you did 30-something years ago when you were 17 is relevant in your 50s in a job interview for, for the Supreme Court or for any other job. I don't think any employer should take into account the actions of a 17. I mean, short of you murdered somebody or if he'd raped her or if he'd done, you know, but, but he didn't rape her, even if he did what he's accused of doing. He certainly didn't murder anybody. He probably got drunk a lot. He probably did really stupid things when he was drunk. Uh, that I have no doubt about. He probably lied to the committee, but, you know, the context of this lying is so, uh, it's so absurd. The whole procedure, the whole circus around this is so absurd that the, 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 the hearing should have never happened. Um, there has to be a statute of limitations for not just criminal statutes of limitation, but also a statute of limitations around, uh, you know, in a sense, job interviews for these kind of things. Stuff you did when you were 17 is irrelevant. So anyway, it's amazing to me how people listen to the show and um, really it, it kind of don't really get what I'm saying at all, at all. But maybe it's my lack of... Uh, my lack of uh, communication skills. We'll have to. We'll have to work on that. Um, so, I, you know, he's going to be approved. Uh, I think that's probably the right thing in this circumstances to do. I think it's tragic, and I think we're going to pay a heavy price into the future. Uh, that the extent to which this has become a bipartisan issue, I think uh, the, this bipartisan uh, this this gulf, complete and utter gulf between Democrats and Republicans. Uh, to the point of, of scheming and dishonesty and just voting almost down the party line and everything is, is incredibly destructive. It, it never used to be like this for the Supreme Court. Um, you know, they did, they did disqualify Bork in, uh, in, in the 80s, but that was primarily because of his legal philosophy. They didn't have to come up with, you know, these, these kind of allegations. But the ugliness, the ugliness of our political lives today, both on the right and on the left, in this case, it's mostly on the left, but it's in this particular case, but it's on both the right and the left. Remember that to a large extent, Republicans started it by not uh, by not considering uh, the Supreme Court nominee that Obama, uh, Obama made, uh, it, it, you know, in it, it was pure partisan politics, understandable, but you know, it wouldn't be surprising that Democrats will do anything to undercut in a, a Republican nominee, given what Republicans did with the uh, Democratic nominee, uh, Obama's Democratic nominee, where they delayed, they basically wouldn't even consider him and said they wouldn't consider him uh, until the until the election, until, uh, until you know, at the time they were... The, the, it was unlikely Donald Trump would win, but but they were hoping, and indeed he won, and, and they got to vacate that appointment and to uh, appoint their own two nominations so uh, nominees so you know in 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 many respects this has been going back and forth uh but um really 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 horrible um the state of our political discourse it's never been good and uh, you know, one of the scariest things to me is when the political parties get along and get together and pass laws. I like gridlock. I like stalemate. But at the end of the day, there's going to be they're going to be heavy prices to pay for for the hatred, the vicious hatred, not just in politics, but not just among politicians, but among the American public around these issues. Because at some point, we're going to have to do something about Social Security. We're going to have to do something about Medicare. You're going to have to cut government spending. 
You're only going to be able to do that if you do it bipartisan, in a bipartisan fashion. You're only going to be able to do it if you get the Republicans and Democrats together uh, to do a plan. It might not be my plan. It might not be an ideal plan. But you have to do something to curb government spending in the next 10 years. If you don't, this country is history. It's toast. It's bankrupt completely, utterly. You know, we go into a depression. We go into long-term stagnation. And, and really, our economy is finished and over. And yet, given the rhetoric by both parties, unless one of the parties gets an overwhelming majority and can do whatever the hell it wants, um, then uh, you're going to have to work together. And there's no possibility because the American people don't want... I mean, it, it, Republicans and Democrats seem to be at the point today where they hate each other's guts. Now... I would have some sympathy towards that if they hated each other's guts because of ideas. But it's not really because of ideas. It's, it's uh, you know, it's superficiality. It's my collectivism versus your collectivism. It's my, um, you know, it's my <sighs> statism versus your statism. There's no real... There's no real fundamental difference anymore between Republicans and Democrats. Anyway, Kavanaugh is going to be elected, so those of you Republicans can uh, uh, can be happy. Uh, but it's 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 really, I think, the state of American politics is really uh, sad, sad and pathetic. And uh, we're going to have to we're going to have to. I don't know what we're going to do. I, I, you know, I, I really fear for the future of the country. Um, politicians un, uh, uh, in any case unwilling to take on the difficult task of actually you know doing the right thing and 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 shrinking government spending and uh, passing regulations or passing deregulation or doing away with regulations at the at the legislative level to actually keep this economy going and to keep us uh, to keep it happening but um It, it, it's not going to happen. So, so where does the country where does the country end up? And it it can end up, and it's not going to get up uh, in in a good place. Um, so, exactly when we, we face these major challenges is is hard to tell. But um, the way we're heading, the tribalism we're encountering, the the collectivism, the brute, uh, unabashed. Um, explicit collectivism we're going to pay a heavy 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 price in the years to come for it uh, uh, we're going to pay a heavy price for trump and we're going to pay a heavy tr tr price already are uh, for the identity politics of the left right and left uh, are failing us and uh and leading us down a very very ugly ugly road well one of the manifestations of this ugly road um is is happened this week in facebook and um, article in the New York Times, I know, I know, I know, I'm not supposed to cite anything from the New York Times. Um, it's, uh, it's a rag, and, and indeed, I believe it is uh, an incredibly biased newspaper, but they actually write news. And, and uh, if you want to know what's going on in the world, there's very few sources to get that. You just have to discount the bias. But this story is about Facebook. It seems pretty accurate. Um, I don't have any reason to doubt it. It didn't seem slanted to me, but then you never know, of course. So I'm giving it to you with the caveats that it comes to the New York Times. And uh, the, a caveat that I would tell you about any newspaper, anything came from. Anyway, it turns out that one of Brett Kavanaugh's best friends, one of Brett Kavanaugh's best friends is a guy named Joe Kaplan. And Joe Kaplan is Facebook's vice president for global public policy. And he is a Republican, and he sits in Washington, D.C., and he's responsible for global public policy. So much for the, for the idea that Facebook is only has leftists. Indeed, Joe Kaplan was hired in 2011, partially to establish some balance. Um, so they hired somebody uh, from the Republican Party to kind of uh, uh, eliminate the suspicions, not eliminate, but, but quiet down the suspicions that they were dominated by the by leftists. Anyway, Joe Kaplan is, turns out, uh, has known Brett Kavanaugh for many years in Washington, D.C. I think they served in the Bush administration together. 
And uh, he is a very senior person at Facebook, although he, he works in the DC office, not in the... It's interesting how all these companies have DC offices. Just an aside, we're going to take a quick aside here. Why do all the tech companies have DC offices? Now, I don't know if the, Apple does, but Google does and Facebook does. Apple probably does. Why? Well, it's a famous story. You probably heard me tell it many times before. But the famous story of Microsoft in the mid-1990s, and Microsoft in the mid-1990s had no Washington office, and Microsoft in the 1990s paid, they spent no money on, um, uh, what do you call it, it's on lobbying, had no lawyers in, uh, in uh, D.C., nothing, right? And they were literally bought in front of Congress, and uh, Aaron Hatch, the Republican from Utah, stood up and yelled at them. You guys have got to get involved in Washington, D.C. You've got to open offices in here. You've got to do, you've got to act, you've got to be in D.C. And Microsoft's response at that meeting was, no, we're not interested. You've got nothing to give us. You leave us alone. We'll leave you alone. We're just going to leave it at that. And they walked out. And of course, you all know the story. A few months later, knock, knock, knock at Microsoft's door. We are here from the Justice Department. We're going to go after you for antitrust because you did to offer a product for free, for free, bundling. You bundled Internet Explorer with, with, with Windows. And uh, Netscape doesn't like that because at the time we were all paying 75 bucks for Netscape. So, you know, and I won't go through the whole story. My Microsoft suffered through the, through the court system and then regulators in-house at Microsoft approving deals for about 10 years, destroyed the company. Uh, what was the lesson learned? Well, the lesson learned from Microsoft was you got to be in D.C. So they spend tens of millions of dollars today. They've got a beautiful building in D.C. They've got a lot of staff in D.C. And, of course, Facebook and Google and the others know this and saw this and, experienced, and, and were looking from the sideline, and they, from the beginning, have had offices in D.C. Now, you might say, oh, they're all cronies. We hate those Silicon Valley companies. No, they, they're just su trying to survive. What are they supposed to do? They saw what happened to Microsoft, and now they're trying to survive. It's an act of self-defense. Anyway, so Joe Kaplan is the lobbyist-in-chief, if you will. Global Public Policy is his title, Vice President for Global. And he, he's a friend of Kavanaugh. And during Kavanaugh's, he sat like uh, two rows behind Kavanaugh and was clearly visible on TV screens. And... This became a big deal at Facebook because the you know Facebook employees. What is a uh, what is a senior official from uh, uh, Facebook doing at Kavanaugh? Are we taking political sides. Now notice suddenly they're worried about taking uh, political sides on the right when they they all, they they so often take political side a political side uh, on the left. Um. Anyway, there's this massive uproar now, uh, at least according to the New York Times uh, and Facebook, about uh, Joel Kaplan going to the testimony of his friends. Joel says he's, he's uh, you know, one of, Kavanaugh's one of his best friends and he wanted to show support. And this is a big deal now. And in the beginning, Zuckerberg has said, look, um, he broke no company rules. This is he didn't wasn't there as a representative of Facebook. He was on time off, although it's where they actually took the time off or later wrote it off as time off. But he wasn't representing Facebook there and so on. And this is not a piece people and people are writing in. This is, you know, Facebook is is this is wrong of Facebook to do. Uh, it makes them feel uncomfortable. This is a snowflake generation, the nutty snowflake generation that that uh, is offended by somebody defending himself against uh, against allegation of sexual uh, sexual you know uh, attack uh, is offended by the fact that somebody might support his friend is offended but won't work in the same company as somebody uh, who won't who, who you know who uh, who might uh, have a different political view or might have a different view of the events around the Kavanaugh hearing. One of the one of the guys at Facebook wrote this uh, actually really good email. Um, you know, uh, uh, Kaplan says, 
friends, especially when times are rough. He, he texted this or emailed this, um, you know, and he said it, we felt it was important to, to be with them at the hearing to express our love, da 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 da. Um, but then last Friday, uh, let's see, you know, uh, the HR people said that Zuckerberg's remark about not making a big deal out of this, basically uh, remarks called stress and trauma and were painful. This is the VP of, uh, VP of HR. I mean, this is, this is the snowflake generation. Many female employees were also upset when Facebook's chief operating officer, Sheryl Sandberg, uh, who supposedly has made women's issue a personal platform and project, I'm reading for the paper, did not publicly say something about all of this. Um, it, it got, you know, she, the Republican, a Republican, you can't do that. Um, she posted uh, last uh, Friday, she said, as a woman and as someone who cares so deeply about how women are treated, the Kavanaugh issue is deeply unsetting, uh, upsetting to me. I've talked to Joel about why I think it was a mistake for him to attend, given his role in the company. But that, but that wasn't good enough. That wasn't good enough for staff at Facebook. Um, so it's, it's, it's just this, you know, this uh, crazy kind of witch hunt. Or, I don't know if it's a witch hunt. But crazy kind of recriminations going on within Facebook. People are really upset. And I don't know how many, it's hard to tell if this is a majority of the people. It clearly is. Um, it clearly is something that is uh, shaking. Um, somebody wrote, let's see, Mr. B 13 year old veteran of um, to, to, to lose it. If you need to change teams, companies, careers, to make sure your day-to-day -day life matches your passions. We will be sad to see you go, but we will understand. We will support you with any path you choose, but it is your responsibility to choose a path, not that of the company you work for. In other words, if you can't handle this, grow up. Uh, that's basically what Bosworth was saying. And then, of course, he had a back battle. He had a back battle immediately after. So uh, you're seeing this, uh, the, and this is... One of the things that the whole Kavanaugh thing brings to the forefront, I think, but really I've brought, I've talked about many times on the show about this trend in our culture, and that is the elevation of emotions above reason. Um, the whole uh, hate speech, the whole offensive speech, the whole snowflake, safe spaces, microaggressions, it's all about elevating emotion above all else. What's important is how you feel. What's important is the emotion that is invoked in you. Everything, everything is 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 about emotion these days. And you saw this with the Kavanaugh hearing, right? Both Ford and Kavanaugh used emotion. It wasn't about facts, neither presented facts, neither presented evidence. I mean, Kavanaugh tried at least to present some evidence in terms of the diary and so on. But, but it, it, what he presented was anger, and I can understand his anger. And, and she presented this, an allegation, and everybody felt sorry for her, and everybody, you know, it seemed like a really sad story. But at the end of the day, it was, th th there was no grounds for it, and now people are demonstrating on, on the basis of what? And now the claim is, now the claim is, we're supposed to, we're supposed to accept Anything a woman says, any accusations a woman says on face value, because she's a woman. And and again, this this is, I think, related to the whole intellectuality of the left, the whole idea of oppressive classes and oppressed classes have, um, you know, their, their words, ha, you know, have more truth value, right? Because remember, postmodernism, and the whole new left agenda, there is no such thing as truth. Everything is subjective. So you have to give more value to somebody who's been oppressed than to somebody who is a white male. And, and so it, it, there's no regard for truth. There's no regard for facts because there's no regard for reason anymore. We live in a culture where reason is being relegated to unimportant. It's relegated to a little bit of science, a little bit of tech, but even in the tech industry, you know, look at these people. I mean, 
I mean, even if even if everything Ford said about Kavanaugh is true, I mean, get a grip. First of all, this is 30 something years ago. Second, okay, it's horrible. It's not nice, but it's not affecting your life. It's not something that you should personally. Uh, it's just, it, it is really, really scary to see people, intelligent people, people who work at Facebook are not idiots, um, completely break down and, 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 and it's pure emotion. And of course, the, the leadership at Facebook has no moral basis by which to defend its position, to sit the position and there's no big deal that Kaplan was there. So it constantly has to backtrack and has to compromise and has to appease the majority. So it, it, it can't stand up and say and take a strong moral stance. It can't articulate a strong moral stance. It can't be pro-reason. It can't take a position. Is, even if the position is a neutral position, it can't take a strong neutral position. We don't have the fact. It's okay to disagree. Uh, the struggle we face today in the world today uh, is the, 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 the battle with the and emotion. And you're seeing that in this example of hearings. You saw that in the demonstration, people getting arrested and all this stuff. Um, and for, for, for evidence, no respect for, there's no respect period, for, for facts, reality, um, relevant for, for context, for, um, for what this, for what this, for what reason represents, for, for thinking in mind, for, for what the Supreme Court represents, and therefore what it is relevant and what is not relevant in, in evaluating the Supreme Court, is none of that, none of that, and, uh, and as a consequence, Part. So I talked about the partnership about the uh, the stripe. and all of that exists uh, in the context of emotions. I mean, uh, tribe versus your tribe versus your emotions. My fear against your fear, my love against your love, and there's no there's no talking about uh, there's no facts because nobody's listening. Everybody's just obsessing about. The, the specific emotions that that are that are involved. You know, the b people hate Kavanaugh not because because he's a you know some people because he's a white male and and they've been trained to hate white males. Some people because he's a Republican and people have been trained to hate white white Republicans. Some people like okay. Uh, one other topic. So again, emotion for reason. Let's let's talk a little bit about, um, yeah, internet. Allah we saw somebody. It, it this is uh, French internet, but it's it's a W hotel. It's supposed to have good internet, but it's not stable. So when I did a speed test, there's enough bandwidth to do up and download and everything. Actually, the upload speeds were quite good. And what we're doing here is uploading. It's the fact that internet it, it, wireless, particularly the hotels, is just unstable and goes in and out. And what you're seeing is sometimes the video is great, sometimes the video is great and it works fine, and then other times it's, it's just awful, and that's just the inconsistency of um, hotel wireless connections. I have to talk about Kavanaugh, the, the Kavanaugh hearings and the Kavanaugh thing again. Um, tech, tech, Techco says speed tests are not the same as video. I'm not sure I understand that. Uh, I thought I thought video is. Video is just one thing that travels, and uh, anyway, I, I don't know. Um, carry the stream to somewhere. I'm trying to get uh, technical advice from my YouTube followers, but I'm not getting I'm not getting anything very successful. Um, I want to talk about Amazon's. Um, I don't know if you heard, but Amazon is now paying all its warehouse employees all its minimum wage employees or its minimum, the people who paid low salaries, they have raised the minimum wage you can get in Amazon to $15 an hour. <laughs> now, this is again an example of how politics and um, 
business are interwound and uh, how politics and business are inseparable. And so think about all the, all the flack that Amazon has been getting from, from the Trump administration and from Bernie Sanders, not an accident to both Trump. Con is not about the, about the, the, the poor workers and, and uh, the low income. And uh, you, you saw Tucker Carlson, Amy Peacock was on Tucker Carlson talking about this uh, uh, Tucker Carlson attacking, attacking um, Amazon for paying its employees too little, right? Too little. And the implication was that something would be done to go after Amazon, Congress is going wants to go after Amazon. Trump certainly has talked often about going after Amazon. Now, the flip side of that is Amazon could say we don't care, like Microsoft did in the early nineties. But Amazon also has vast contracts with the government. Uh, Amazon's cloud services provides massive services to the U.S. government, and of course, they don't want to have the government pressure them on price. They don't want to have the government maybe withdraw from Amazon cloud services. There is competition to Amazon cloud services. But they they just, you know, the government is, is waving a gun at them. It's not quite pointing at them. It's not quite pulling the trigger. Trump hasn't done anything. But rhetoric matters. The bully pulpit matters. Threats matter. So the fact that they have been harassed by Trump for all these months, the fact that the Democrat who had for Robert who, who, who could pay his employees more but doesn't, all of that, you know, all of that is, uh, I think, ultimately causes Amazon, uh, caused Amazon to say, okay, you know, we'll raise the minimum wage to 15. We'll do what you want. And by the way, Amazon said, we are now going to lobby for a nationwide $15 an hour. Because if we're going to have to raise it to $15 an hour, we should damn would like our, our competitors to raise it to $15 an hour. But then soon enough, it is, it becomes uh, you advocating to, to penalize your own competitors. And uh, ultimately, this is a game that everybody uses, including it's really sad and tragic to see this happening. Uh, it's, it's sad and tragic to see Amazon playing the game. But, but on the other hand, play, you know, what choice do they have? What choice, choice. And that's why once they did make the raise, the only way they could deal with losing a competitive advantage is by trying to get the government to raise the minimum wage on everybody, right? It's sad, really, 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 really sad. And, and all of you, all the people who supported Trump and his attacks on Amazon, all the people who uh, supported Tucker Carlson and their attack on Amazon, now you get the consequence. You get more cronyism, more entrenchment, more government, ultimately, not explicit government intervention, but implicit government intervention where they don't even have to pass a law. Business already cooperates with them. And at the same time, business is lobbying for all kinds of other things at the same time. It's truly, truly horrific. Now, what they also did was they eliminated bonuses and stock awards to the same employees. So on the one hand, the employees are getting a higher fixed rate, but they are losing their stock awards and their monthly bonuses. You know, is that a good trade-off? It's not, I'm not sure it's good. It's certainly not good for Amazon, right? Amazon would above market prices. Amazon cannot pay its workers $100 an hour. Why? Because then it can't compete. It can't compete. So Amazon is in a position where the only way it can raise the, the, the minimum wage to its employees 
is by decreasing their wages, decreasing uh, the um, you know using the bonuses in the stock in the stock awards, which is you know you know part of the reason he gets bonuses in stock awards is to incentivize, is to motivate. It has an important function in the company. But again, politics and business, politics and business should not go together. And the only way, the only way to separate politics and business is to make the people with a gun unable to use it. In other words, the only way to eliminate cronyism is to cripple government. It, it, or, or basically to, to limit government to its proper function, to make it impossible for government, make it impossible for government to uh, use its gun on business, make it impossible for government to regulate, to control government. The only way to get rid of cronyism is to se separate economics from politics. It's to separate economics from politics. And until we do that, we will have cronyism because business has to defend itself. It has to defend itself. So, you know, it's sad. It really, when I read this about Amazon, it was sad and inevitable because when the right and the left unite against you, you're going to give in. You're going to capitulate. And even Amazon, as great of a company as it is, as much as I love Jeff Bezos, as much as I love everything Amazon does, even Amazon has caved. It's, it's, it's the split between um, reason and emotion. Uh, oh, those poor employees who don't make enough money. And to think about the welfare state, to think about the, fa the taxes, to think about the, the lack of productivity and growth because of regulations, because of controls, because of, of, of all this garbage, that requires thinking, that requires studying, that requires knowledge, that requires reason to emote, to feel. That's easy. That's easy. And that's what everybody plays on. That's what Trump plays on. That's what the Democrats play on. That's what everybody plays on. And 